Hello, Patreon friends. This is the Patreon Obscure Worldwide bonus episode one, Ghosts of the Tsunami. I'm aware of the bonds that were created today. When you told me that sure there's a way. The water so still, the map pain has gone away. The air is much cleaner. March 11th, 2011 was any other day in Japan. People were going to work, going to school, going about their business. But what they didn't anticipate was an earthquake. Now, I'm sure y'all know earthquakes happen all the time in Japan. They're a pretty commonplace occurrence. But this one was a magnitude 9.1 on the Richter scale out of 10. And it is so seldom that one that strong happens anywhere on earth. It struck Japan's coast, the northwest region of Japan called Tohoku. Now the earthquake was bad enough at a level that can cause such destruction like that. But the biggest problem was that the earthquake was so strong that an hour following there was an incredibly powerful tsunami that followed. The tidal waves from that tsunami reached 133 feet high. That's 40 and a half meters for my international people. And it went six miles or 9.6 kilometers inland. So it's 133 foot tall wall of water for six miles from the shore. It erased that entire portion of Japan and carried it out to sea. The tsunami left more than 18,000 people dead, and some estimates are as high as 20,000. And about 2,500 people are still missing to this day. It was the single greatest loss of life in Japan since the atomic bomb in World War II. So, as you can see, it was absolutely devastating. Now, what's really fascinating is in the months following the earthquake and the tsunami, people in Ishinomaki, that area of Japan where it happened, reported seeing spirits of people trying to find their way home. And these spirits were being seen in mass. This phenomenon really came to light when a a sociology graduate student, Yuka Kudo, she wrote a paper in the months following the tsunami detailing these experiences. And her professor was honestly pretty impressed because she did a lot of research. She spoke with over 100 taxi drivers in the area because she noticed that they seemed to have the majority of these stories. Now, most of them, the vast majority of these drivers, just pretended they didn't hear her ask anything about ghosts. I don't know if they thought she was a little kooky or they just didn't want to talk about it. But seven of them did agree to talk to her and told her some of their stories. And they seemed pretty convinced that they had given rides to ghosts of people who had died in the tsunami. One driver told her the story of a woman wearing a winter coat to get into his cab near Ishinomaki Station. And she asked to go to the Miyagi District. That was really weird because the Miyagi District had been completely decimated in the tsunami. So he explained to her that there was really nothing left there and asked her if she was sure. And she looked at him and asked him in a quivering voice, Have I died? He turned to look back at her, and she was just gone. She disappeared. Another driver mentioned a man who also got into his taxi wearing a winter coat in the middle of summer. So obviously that's pretty strange, but he just had an odd feeling about the guy that he couldn't explain. The man wanted to go a little bit far away to a nearby mountain. So as they were almost there at about sunset, the driver looked back and the man was gone. He'd also disappeared. Now, sometimes when these passengers disappear, 
They leave the seat soaked with seawater. An expat author, Richard Lloyd Perry, wrote a book, Ghosts of the Tsunami, Death and Life in Japan's Disaster. In his novel, he talks about the experiences of Takashi Ono, which is a pseudonym because the man was too ashamed to put his real name out into the world after this experience. Takashi feels like he had been possessed by a spirit of someone who died in the tsunami. Now, Takashi is a pleasant, perfectly ordinary guy who lived a few miles away from where the tsunami struck. So he really wanted to check things out and see how bad it was. So he loaded up and drove to the beach one day to survey the devastation. He recalls being in a jovial mood, eating an ice cream cone, listening to music. And then when it became difficult to reach the area of devastation because of all the emergency vehicles and roadblocks, he handmade a sign and put it in his windshield saying disaster relief, just so he could get closer to see the devastation. You heard me right. He was himself devastated at seeing that level of destruction. He explains that it was clear where the wave had reached. There was a clear delineation between the complete devastation and perfect normalcy where the wave had landed. After his journey out there, he went home, had dinner with his family, some tea, a beer or two, you know, his usual evening stuff. But then he says he began to feel really sad, calling his friends to check on them and ask about their day. He explains later that he didn't really know what to say. He just felt like he should reach out to people that he loves after seeing something like that. Completely understandable. What's not really understandable is then he started rolling around on the floor, making animal noises. And he ran into the field behind their home to literally roll in the mud. His wife and mother that he lived with were understandably absolutely horrified. He flopped around as if he were being tossed in a wave, repeating, You must die. You must die. Everyone must die. Everything must die and be lost. He pointed out into the empty field behind the house, saying, There! Over there! They're all over there! I'm coming to you! I'm coming to that side! He finally cried out, There's something on top of me! Before finally passing out asleep. When he woke up the next day, he didn't remember any of this. But for three days, he was talking in a really weird, guttural way. Talking about the dead, threatening violence to his family. All kinds of bizarre things like that. The following night, he recalls watching out the window, watching a line of people parade by on the sidewalk, somberly, wearing soaking wet and muddy clothes. He didn't feel confused or alarmed by this somehow, but instead wondered why they didn't or couldn't change their clothes. Finally, his family convinced him to go see the local priest, Tayo Kanada, who drove out the spirits by reciting the Buddhist sutras. Tayo also didn't hesitate to give him a good tongue lashing, telling him that instead of respect and reverence for the dead, he went there to gawk and blatantly disrespect them with his ice cream cone and homemade and bullshit disaster relief sign. Tayo explains that he's lucky he didn't have it worse because this was possibly his punishment for his actions. All of the dead that couldn't acknowledge or accept their passing were displaying their resentment through Takeshi, according to the monk. One interesting thing to note is that there was actually a little bit of evidence backing up these stories, because these taxi drivers had their ride logs showing that these fares were unpaid. And some of these poor drivers actually were a little frustrated because this happens often enough that they were routinely not getting paid for rides because people disappeared from their back seat. But the drivers did say that they weren't afraid. They never felt like they were in danger, and after it was over, they felt like they probably did help somebody pass on peacefully to wherever their spiritual destination was. Taxi drivers were not the only witnesses, though, because police got hundreds of calls reporting 
ghosts hanging out in groups in areas of housing districts, standing in line at shopping malls, just wherever you would normally see people, people are seeing spirits. Largely, it seems like they just don't know they're dead yet. Some people report seeing their neighbors, who they know died in the tsunami, outside their homes sitting down into puddles of water. Some people say they see quote-unquote spooky figures on the beach. People who are out for a drive or on their way somewhere often report that they see someone soaking wet and looking like they're lost. And if they stop and talk to them, sometimes they ask for help getting home. One of the creepier reports I found is one man said that he didn't want to leave his house anymore because he saw dead people's eyes reflected in the puddles on the ground. At one of the refugee communities in Onagawa, a former neighbor would pop in for a cup of tea with the the really surprised residents who lived there. But sadly, they didn't have the heart to tell her she was dead, even though the poor thing had seaweed hanging from her clothes and The cushion that she sat on when she had her tea would be soaking wet when she left. The aforementioned priest and Buddhist monk, Tayo Kanada, worked to help people that felt like they'd been possessed by the spirits of those who died in the tsunami, or people who just couldn't overcome their grief afterward. Tayo is a very educated and logical man, and when asked if he believes in all the hauntings, he said that what he believes doesn't matter at all. All that matters is that he believes people are suffering and they're experiencing this and he wants to help them. In his mind, all of this, whether it's real or imagined, stems from the immense grief of the Japanese people as a whole. All of this pain, all of this trauma, all of the hauntings, they're all rooted in sadness as far as he's concerned. The grief of the people is immense. Of course, not only did they lose their loved ones and so many of their fellow countrymen, but they were also coping with the loss of their homes and livelihoods all at the same time. All at once, with almost no warning, they had absolutely nothing left on a mass scale. The event and the magnitude of this loss was so shocking that so many of the Japanese people ceased to function entirely for a while. It makes perfect sense to me. They're staring, lost, unsure of where to go or what to do, and sometimes they don't even know where they are. Monk Tayo has been making an effort to heal the area and its people by organizing with his fellow monks to sit with survivors and have a cup of tea. He recognizes that pain is extensive in silence, and just having somebody to talk to can make so much difference especially in the communities of people who are in temporary housing after losing everything. Those survivors tell Tayo about their loss and about seeing the spirits of people. Strangers, friends, neighbors, sometimes their own loved ones, in offices, public places, the beach, the decimated towns. In turn, he offers them comfort, allows them to express their grief, and encourages mourning amongst the community as a way to heal, especially amongst a group of people as polite as the Japanese who often don't express extreme emotion openly. These stories are so fascinating to me because you don't usually hear about hauntings on a mass scale like this, and at least for a year following the tsunami, this was so commonplace. Now, if you remember these events at all as they happened, It wasn't only the devastation from the earthquake and the tsunami that people were struggling with. The tsunami also led to meltdown of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, releasing radioactive material into the air, land, and sea. Thankfully, mass evacuations protected the safety of the people in mass. Although, only time will tell what the long-term implications of the radiation are. So these people not only lost their families, countrymen, homes, jobs, all of their belongings, but then, very shortly following, the survivors were urgently evacuated from a large area under threat of nuclear fallout. And 
I only remind you that so you keep in mind this huge contributing factor to the massive amount of nationwide, really worldwide grief that people were feeling in that moment. So considering all of these factors mentioned, it is not surprising at all that people are witnessing haunting on such a mass scale. That tremendous level of pain and loss, it would be honestly surprising if this weren't the case. I haven't found good sources to tell me if people are still experiencing the hauntings to the same degree as they were in the year following the disasters. So I am curious if it has tapered off or not, and I'm really hoping that these spirits have found peace and aren't wandering lost anymore. Because honestly, I can't imagine many things worse than forever trying to find your way home. I've mentioned liminal spaces in another episode before, but taxis are the epitome of liminal spaces. It's an in-between. You're not in one place or the other. And for some reason, it is known that paranormal activity is higher in liminal spaces. These people are all just trying to find home. And so many of them don't know they're dead, and it all makes perfect sense. I love that the monk is trying to heal the community on a larger scale. He puts his own beliefs aside to help people and encourage open discourse about pain and grief. And I also love that he put that one guy in his place for putting a freaking sign on his windshield saying he's disaster relief just to go gawk at part of the country being destroyed. I understand now why that man did not want his name put out into the public. Well, y'all, that concludes episode one of Obscure Worldwide, the bonus series for patrons. I hope you enjoyed it. The bi-weekly podcast episodes are really labor-intensive because I have to do so much research, writing, recording, editing. So the more casual Patreon episodes are a really refreshing change of pace. What did you think about this episode format? As always, I'm a big fan of polite but honest feedback, so please let me know your thoughts. Bonus episode two for patrons only will be about Teresita Bassa, the ghost who solved her own murder. Thanks, y'all. Until next time.